Hi, everybody. I'm Greg Regano. I live in New York, spend about six months in New York, uh, another six months of the year out at uh, Stanford. I'm an advisor to the Stanford Spark Translational Research Program. Uh, we'll be going through that a little bit later in the presentation. I'm going to propose a very radical transformation of drug development at global scale. Uh, before we get started, I'm really grateful to be here. This is an incredible mind share. Um, it reminds me of an early software developer conference started in 2015, and it's grown into thousands of uh, engineers and software developers all over the world, and I see very similar uh, similarities between this and that. So I just want to thank you, thank Chaz, uh, Beverly, Emily, Jem, Glenn, Harriet, and then Aubrey de Grey, I believe Chaz's old classmate, uh, introduced us. Um, so thank you again for having me here. So who am I? Uh, we're all humans. I just want to make sure everybody grasps that. So whether it's big pharma, uh, scientists, nonprofits, charities, biotechs, we're all human at the end of the day. We will all be patients um, at one point. Founder and CEO to Iku, which is a uh, essentially a blockchain-based digital licensing platform for medical research. As I said, advisor to Stanford Medicine's Spark Translational Research Program. I come at this problem from many different angles, pretty much wearing every hat you could think of. I'm a pediatric oncology survivor, so and I actually got access to a drug that was not approved at the time, and that helped save my life for me to be here today. So thank you to my parents and the great doctors I had for that. Um, in addition, I am an intellectual property lawyer. I have worked with uh, large pharmaceutical companies at a big, ugly international law firm. Um, I've also worked with small biotechs, brilliant scientists in the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. and Taiwan. Worked with universities, nonprofits, CROs. So I, I've really seen it from every angle. I'm also personally a drug developer um, and investor. And more recently, over the last few years, I became a student of blockchains because of their ability to unlock uh, human coordination at unprecedented global scale. So let's just get right into the problem. I'm going to cut right to it. It's all about economic incentives. There's the valley of death. Uh, there's, we're all competing for funding constantly. Um, everyone's angry at Big Pharma because they have all the money. Uh, there's governments. There's nonprofits, but there's not nearly enough money to go around. And why is this? It's really because the patent system has historically been the economic incentive to make medical research go. The irony here, though, so the patent system was great when it first came about, uh, when the United States essentially uh, broke off from England. Here we are today. Uh, one of the reasons why the United States is such a high GDP is a lot of the brilliant scientists from Europe went to the US. Um, and there was actually a tremendous amount of intellectual property theft from Europe to the US. But when you have a big military, you could say it's not theft, it's just innovation. <laughs> and that worked really well for maybe 200 or so years. But since the advent of the internet, um, it's caused significant issues. And why is that? Because in order to get a patent granted, you need to show that your invention, not a discovery, but actual invention, um, is new, uh, non-obvious. And the issue is that because of the internet, there is so much what they call prior art publications out there that can be used to invalidate your patents. It's led to extreme amounts of litigation. In the US, um, over 50% of patents are invalidated after they're granted. Um, some experts speculate that it's as high as 90%, depending on how you calculate it. And the greatest example of this is the cure to hepatitis C. Uh, Sovaldi by Gilead Sciences, cure to a virus. In my opinion, this is the most brilliant, important thing to have happened in the 21st century. Literally, cure to a virus, it was said to be impossible since essentially the beginning of time. Um, a small biotech called Pharmacet uh, figured out the molecule to do it, for which Gilead acquired them, I believe, in 2012 or so for approximately $13 billion dollars you know, expecting that they had an extremely tight patent, because again, brand new molecule had never existed before. And, you know, if the virus, if it's the first cure to a virus of all time, you would expect that patent to be really robust, right? Well, no. So the patent was in invalidated 
after the five-year data exclusivity period for which now there's mass competition on the market. Um, there's a tremendous amount, I don't want to call them generics, but more or less generics that are bringing the price down, which is good for patients, but at the same time it's bad for Gilead um, and, and, and Pharmacet because they likely would have never ex spent all of that money, uh, $13 billion, to cure hepatitis C had they known that they would have only had five years of exclusivity. So the key takeaway here is if Gilead, uh, about a $15 billion market cap biotech, can enforce a patent on a brand new molecule for the first ever cure to a virus, how are you going to do it? It's a tremendous issue. So we're essentially in a market failure. Um, as Chaz has been saying this whole conference, there's 10,000 diseases out there, 7,000 of which are rare diseases. And according to the US government, only 600 of those 10,000 have treatments. So 95% of diseases don't have quality treatments. So, you know, what's going on? Uh, we, we have to fix this problem, and that's why we're here today. Um, the main reason to this, for this is economic incent incentives generally only accrue to the executives and shareholders, as opposed to you brilliant people in the audience, the scientists, and of course the patients. So just to summarize this, the, the current way research is monetized is indirect. Uh, scientist makes a discovery in the lab, uh, has to file a patent on it, um, and as we just discussed in the IP uh, business breakout session, if there's no issues, you know, no litigation, it could take up to four years to get that patent granted, um, which, you know, we all have limited time on this earth, and to me that's, you know, societally unacceptable. Um, and it's extremely possible because of the digital age and all the prior art out there, you may never get a patent. So you could have a cure to any disease, but if you can't get a patent, you, it just, in this current system, it will not command the, in, command the investment necessary to bring it to patients. Um, so discovery patent company acquires the patent and then you sell equity in the company. That requires lawyers, accountants, endless amount of agreements, um, just significant amount of friction, definitely cannot scale. So I, I want to back up a little bit and just talk about how the best economies in the world operate. Um, and that's what we're all kind of doing here is we're trying to fix the economy of drug development. So according to Ray Dalio, he's arguably the most successful hedge fund manager of all time, uh, Bridgewater Capital. He has this really great YouTube video called How the Economic Machine Works. And the key takeaway from it is that is the velocity of money. So instead of uh, a wealthy person hoarding all their money, they can actually, it, it's better for them to put it in the system to create economic value. So the more times one pound or one dollar turns over, uh, essentially you're increasing the velocity of it within a system, the more value that economy has. And the interesting thing here is that patents generally have a velocity of zero, which is continuing to lead to the market failure. You know, a, a scientist, biotech, pharmaceutical company, university, nonprofit will get a patent, and how many times will that patent be transferred for uh, another party to extract value from it, to exploit it? Absolutely under 10 times in its lifetime, most of the time zero, as opposed to uh, a dollar or a pound, which is changing hands regularly every day. And the, mo the more open the system is, the more open the economy is, the more transactions of value you could have. So this brings us now going even further back in time, the pre-internet. So I assume everybody here uses the internet quite regularly. Raise your hand if you don't use the internet. Okay, no one raise their hand. Everybody here uses the internet. Has anyone ever used Microsoft Net? Not Microsoft, but Microsoft Net. Does anyone even know what Microsoft Net is? Okay, no one knows what Microsoft Net is, and why should you? So Microsoft Net was essentially um, more or less a permission system, an intranet in which it was not permissionless, it was not open, um, you had to ask permission from Microsoft to get in. And that had its limitations. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, Linux, open source, open, source, open source software development came around 
and led us to where we are today with the World Wide Web, um, which is essentially free, decentralized, permissionless for anyone in the world to use. The top five corporations in the world all use the internet uh, to proliferate, um, including Google, Facebook, for, you know, everybody may hate Facebook, but they're almost a trillion dollar uh, market cap. Amazon, Apple, they all use the internet as a public infrastructure and then monetize on top of that. Why? Because it's permissionless, decentralized, and they have great confidence that this system is never going to go down. So building on this, these are four of my personal favorite um, open systems for innovation that all use the internet in one form or, or another. So um, let's just get right into it. So we have GitHub and then SciHub v. Elsevier, Patients Like Me, and Stanford Spark. We're going to briefly talk about each one. So what is GitHub? Um, it is a software development platform, again, accessible to anybody in the world with internet access. And it brings together the world's largest community of developers to discover, share, and build better software. Acquired by Microsoft for $7 billion. It's free to use. Essentially, it is the um, panacea for open source software development. Every major corporation uh, uses it to build out software. But in addition, it just has individual software developers collaborating all across the world, may have met, never met each other, they could communicate, uh, submit pull requests, edit each other's code, take code in directions that you know, they otherwise couldn't think of. It's extremely nonlinear, uh, multi-directional. And as you can see on the left side here, um, the just in, in the whole slide, all of the contributions are quantified. So I believe that SGC has a similar mechanism with digital lab notebooks in which you could kind of see what everybody's working on. It's generally open um, and it's cross communications across all the different universities that are within there. Who here is familiar with SciHub? It's okay, you could raise your hand. The camera can see you. So SciHub uh, was essentially developed by um, an Eastern European hacker who decided that all medical information should be free. There should be no paywalls for medical journals. So contrast that with, and, and this is just on the internet. You could go, you could Google SciHub, um, download the extension, and you basically get past the paywall for any medical journal article, really, that's ever existed. So it's totally free. Contrast this with Elsevier, who's the number one medical journal publisher in the world. So Elsevier is the king of the paywall, right? Um, and you would expect, because SciHub exists, and now it's just free access, you know, hack through the paywalls, that Elsevier's revenues would go down. It's actually the complete opposite. Elsevier's revenues have been steadily increasing over the last five to 10 years or so, um, with most recently, uh, they took in uh, 2.5 billion pounds, which is over $3 billion. And the key issue here, as it is in open source software development, is copyright. So what is copyright? It's a legal right that protects the use of your work once it has been physically expressed. It applies to any unique information expressed in a tangible medium. So what does that mean? Essentially, you write something down that's unique. You publish it, and you have the ability to attach Chaz Buntra, all rights reserved, in which any third party would have to come to you and license that for you to, from you to use it in any capacity. Uh, distribution rights attached to this, commercialization rights, research rights, publication rights, translation rights. Basically, it's, it's, it's the whole ball of rights. And what's really important to understand is that you cannot obtain a patent without owning the research information first, or at least having a license to it. So in order to obtain a patent, you have to put your, uh, your experimental data, your research data in the patent to kind of get your claim. And you can't do that without actually performing the research first, which means that you're performing this unique experiment and writing it down. So unique information expressed in a tangible, me tangible medium, you obtain the copyright and then you could get the patent. So just to clarify, key takeaway here, 
is it goes patent, and then, excuse me, it goes copyright, and then once you obtain your copyright, all rights reserved, then you could apply for a patent. The really brilliant thing about copyright is that all across the globe, it's objectively enforced. This is essentially the law throughout the world. Once you put a unique piece of information on paper, write all rights reserved on it, you obtain copyright. That's an objective standard compared to the patent system, which is a subjective standard. Sure, you could get a patent granted, but as we saw before, you may have a third party, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, patent troll, hedge fund, uh, try to invalidate your patent for whatever market-based reason, and then it's up to the government court system to decide whether or not your patent should be enforced or invalidated. This is probably my favorite example of disrupting medical information at global scale using digital systems. So patients like me, they are also monetizing data, essentially of copyright. So I'm not sure of their exact valuation, but they started out with Series A, uh, raising about under $10 million in 2013. And then most recently in 2017, they raised over $100 million. So something must be working. So how does it work? It's a for-profit patient network and real-time research platform. Um, you could think of it almost like, uh, I don't, I don't want to say Facebook in some capacity, but basically it enables patients in any disease vertical. It actually started with ALS. It allows patients in any disease vertical to uh, connect and exchange knowledge to improve outcomes. So what does that mean? Maybe their doctors are not communicating. Obviously, they're not. Uh, researchers are often siloed. Uh, the SGC is, and Spark are the total outliers. Most researchers are just kind of in their labs working alone. So what this does is it brings patients together who are usually the most desperate um, and pushing science forward without you know, having to deal with patent trolls and the current system, whatever. And they're exchanging information uh, digitally at global scale. They have over 600,000 members signed up to date. And the key takeaway here is patients like me owns all the data. They own all the data points. So what does that mean they own it, right? These are usually non-patentable data points, but somehow they've managed to become valued at over $100 million aggregating non-patentable data points. It's pretty interesting. So what does that mean? They're actually monetizing the copyright. They own the information. So in the way they monetize it through the analog system generally is they package this information up nicely. They may put an analytics platform over the top of it, and they'll sell it to insurance providers, pharmaceutical companies, what have you. But again, they're monetizing the data, specifically the copyright. Now we'll get into the Stanford Spark Translational Research Program, which has significant similarities to the, um, the SGC. Um, it's really just extremely successful, robust. The SGC is a little bit earlier stage. They call it pre-competitive, pre in which um, you know, everybody's collaborating more in a pre-clinical pre setting. The Stanford Spark and now Spark Global Program is really about bringing medicines to patients as efficiently as possible. Um, and that could mean in commercial settings, it could mean getting information to doctors to use uh, off-label treatments, uh, never really compulsory licenses because that has its own uh, set of issues, um, investigator-initiated studies, INDs. Um, and I'm briefly just going to explain how it works. So. Each year or each semester, the Stanford Spark program, which is generously funded by Stanford Medical School, they'll put out a request for proposals to uh, anyone in the Stanford system or an affiliate of the university. And usually they have uh, specific research verticals that they want to hit on. Uh, a governance committee of about 15 very, very high-end scientists will decide which programs are most efficient and which have the best chance to get to, get to patients um, most efficiently and as quickly as possible. The SPARC program will then fund somewhere between 5 to 15 of those proposals for $100,000 for two years. These are the SPARKies, the, the SPARC scholars. And every Wednesday during the semester, uh, the directors and then Spark advisors, of which I am one of them, which are industry experts, could be lawyers, chemists, 
consultants, people from big pharma, venture capitalists. Every Wednesday during the semester, the Sparkies have to present their research. And there's open knowledge exchange within the room in which the directors, advisors, and Sparkies are regularly um, mining the research collectively, mining the data to position these assets to get to patients as quickly and most efficiently as possible. The key item here, though, is that before entering the room and before becoming a member of a specific Spark initiative, you have to sign a confidentiality agreement to enter the room. So that's kind of like the enforcement layer. So just to kind of sum up this slide, so over the last, Spark, Spark started just about the same time as the SGC. Um, over the last 12 years, they've received about $7 million in funding from the university. And it's gone on, these research projects, research initiatives, have gone on to generate over $100 million in external funding, which could be uh, venture capital, pharma, government grants. So again, that's over a 1,000% return, you could call it. This has also come with brilliant success rates. So the way they quantify success is not necessarily how much money you make, right? But it's really how many patients have you successfully brought medicine to. So 62% success rate, and it's really about bridging that valley of death, going from uh, preclinical into uh, more or less phase two. Can you get efficacy in humans? And they've been able to pull that off 62% of the time in which the valley of death is usually under 10%. So it's pretty incredible. So why not replicate this in as many places as possible, right? So there is now a, so it started with Stanford Spark, that was kind of the genesis, and now there is Spark on every continent, every inhabited continent in the world, um, including Asia, Africa, Europe, hoping we could get something going here, um, the SGC at Oxford, Australia, US, and Brazil. So when I came across Spark, uh, my mind was blown. This was a, an open knowledge exchange environment in which everyone was collaborating and now with Spark Global at really global scale. So, and, and it's done in an analog fashion. So I, I'm looking at it from um, how do we scale this up and kind of blow this model wide open. So Metcalf's law, the value of a telecommunications network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users of the system. So in studying all of this, um, I've, I've pretty much looked at the leaders in the field, um, including Chaz, Andrew Lowe at MIT, who's been uh, pioneering financial engineering for medical research. He also works closely with Spark. Spark, patients like me, GitHub, Ray Dalio, Satoshi Nakamoto, who is the um, pseudonymous founder and inventor of blockchain, also Bitcoin. Uh, the Sci-Hub Elsevier dynamic. Bruce Bloom, who is CEO of Cures Within Reach. He leads a drug repurposing initiative based out of Chicago. And Dominic Williams, who is the chief scientist of a next generation high throughput blockchain. Our story starts here in the cell. That's me, a mitochondrion, and I make energy for your cells. As you get older, mitochondria get easier to damage, produce less energy, and eventually you die. Listen, I'd rather stay alive too. You humans suffer from 10,000 diseases, but only 600 have known treatments. All this lovely research could keep mitochondria healthy and you living longer. But most of it goes untouched. Finding new molecules brings the fortunes and corporations would rather make a pretty penny than help us live longer. They use patents to lock research down, closing it off to the public. It takes $2.6 billion to get one new drug through clinical trials, while all the other research goes untouched. There's a backlog of 20 years of drugs waiting to be tested that can't be funded. Years off our lives. It doesn't have to be this way. 
Enter the Iku universe. Iku is a public utility powered by smart contracts that allows anyone to directly license and monetize research. Let's say you found a way of preventing free radicals from hurting mitochondria. You can't wait. You need funding to continue your research and trial a new therapy. Instead of chasing down a patent and waiting years for funding, you offer licenses to your research in exchange for the funds you need. Similar to how a record label licenses music. On Iku, each license is a blockchain-based token market accessible by anyone. No third party, no friction. Iku accelerates biotech research and development by enabling the permissionless exchange of data. Open the floodgates of treatments and cures. Put science back in the hands of scientists. Iku's digital licensing markets mean exponentially less costs, more funding, more clinical trials, and more life. So EQ, uh, what we're striving to make it is a decentralized, permissionless, resilient network that no one party has control over. And more, more specifically, we want to bring together all the stakeholders, so align everybody, um, including patients, scientists, uh, funders, even pharma, universities, nonprofits at global scale, creating essentially a cybernetic collective of people and machines plugged in as nodes on the network fueling innovation and owning its value because each contribution and the monetization there too would be based on a public blockchain. This aligns incentives, allowing anyone with internet access to have skin in the game. So this is really important because it breaks down the big pharma traditional shareholder model and opens it up to really anybody in the world with internet. So I'm briefly gonna get into kind of how a blockchain works um, and the concept of proof of existence. So when you have a, a single party, um, whether it be a bank or a university or a pharmaceutical company controlling uh, a database, you have to trust them to basically guarantee its provenance and legitimacy all the way through. And this is fine and it's worked well, you know, we're all alive, generally healthy, but it comes with significant costs and trust in that you need uh, large institutions, lawyers, court systems to enforce this chain of title over time. And this is what leads to significant litigation. Whereas if you onboard all of these operations, essentially any information-based asset to a blockchain, you could use a decentralized network to enforce this. So what does that mean? Basically the provenance of value instead of being enforced by one private network that kind of controls the database, it's enforced by a, a global decentralized network that no one party has control over. This then enables for one record of truth. So for example, when you're transferring intellectual property, whether it's a patent, data, copyright, from one party to another, you have to have essentially a lawyer guarantee chain of title. Um, there's significant friction there. It takes months for a deal to go through. Um, and the lawyer's legal license is on the line. Um, and this can't really scale between jurisdictions. Whereas if it's on a blockchain, all you're doing is enabling a decentralized system to validate each transaction. And this can happen within seconds. So it enables essentially like we went into before, uh, larger economies to take off because there's greater, more efficient exchange of value, increases the velocity of intellectual property. And then what this then enables is for a patients like me type environment to occur in which you can aggregate tremendous amounts of research data that anyone can fungibly own. Fungible means that, so historically a patent is just one piece of intellectual property that's owned by one party. When it becomes fungible, it could be broken down into potentially millions or billions of pieces such that any one party could own a piece. Again, because it's enforced on a public decentralized digital network. Um, the, the real key thing that we're trying to do here 
is democratize access to medical information and push innov innovation forward as quickly and efficiently as possible. So this is a quote from Andrew Lowe, professor of, at MIT for financial engineering. I'm just gonna read it out loud. The principles that made the world's financial markets significantly more liquid, more efficient, and more accessible could cause financial, uh, financing and interest to explode in biomedical research. And again, financial markets are fully digital. So why aren't our intellectual property markets fully digital as well? Um, just to kind of key takeaways here. So ECU, the research, data, because it is now um, in a public decentralized network, it actually could become money itself. Because in the traditional system, you have to go through research patent company equity to get to the money. So you, you really want to monetize the research in the legacy system, but you have to go through all these items to get there, without, whereas in a proof of existence blockchain system, the data is money itself. So, and this could potentially, this is very radical and potentially a little mind blowing, but if you think about it and you look at the research uh, or the history, 99% uh, of currencies fail within 30 years globally. The minds in this room could likely just collectively come together and issue a currency that would outlast, you know, any, uh, any currency in Africa, South America, or Southeast Asia. So if medical research, which in my opinion is the most important information in the world, could be directly monetized, the only thing that's stopping us from doing so is our collective incentive to make that happen, of which blockchains um, can really align that. Key question I get all the time, why can't someone steal the research? So if it's open source, why can't you know, pharma come along or some patent troll or some bad actor come in and just take the research? Well, you can. But the question I put back onto you is if Sci-Hub exists and every medical journal is now fully open access because of Sci-Hub, why are Elsevier's revenues increasing to over $3 billion in the last year? It's because enforcement of copyright. And I'll just give you one quick example. So we can all go on Spotify and listen to music right now for free. It's wonderful. We can just really realize the value of free art. If um, Disney wants to put any of those songs in a motion picture, well, Disney has to take a license to it. So the individuals at Disney could listen to the music at home for their own private use for free, but as soon as they want to commercialize this music, they need a license to it. Again, another great example of this is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin started out at worth less than a penny. Now it's about $5,000 per Bitcoin. And people are regularly trying to steal the code, essentially fork the protocol. Bitcoin is totally open source. Anybody here could steal the code at any time they want and issue a new currency. That has been tried over 100 times and it never works. Why? Because of the community that's behind it. It's essentially the most brilliant minds in computer science, computer science coming together and making this open source currency valuable. So in a similar situation, if we bring the most brilliant minds in medical research together and issue a digital commodity on top of that, and we kind of stick together because we're economically incentivized, it can really go a long way. And the third reason why you can't steal it is data provenance. If you go and print uh, research data off of Sci-Hub and you bring that to the FDA or any, any um, equivalent throughout the world, they're going to say, do you have a license to this research? Can you prove that you actually did it? And you're going to say, no, I printed it off Sci-Hub. So that's not going to grant you data exclusivity periods in any capacity or advance your research program. So where do we start? So instead of patents, we're going with copyrights. So biomarkers, at least in the US, are generally unpatentable. Um, preventative medicine is also generally very difficult to patent. And this is what has led to kind of everybody going after small molecules and biologics. So after you're sick, we'll kind of help you out. If we're, if we're able to stack, essentially, data aggregation of biomarkers and prevention in a research repository, and then for any third party to take a commercial license to that, they need to become part of our blockchain network, which could be done permissionlessly on an open market. You know, a lot could happen there. But my favorite, and I think the most efficient form of this that could happen immediately and scale medical research for low cost is drug repurposing, which has been a key theme at this conference today um, and yesterday as well. So what is drug repurposing? It's essentially taking drugs that already exist and finding new indications for them. And this could be new IP generating in that you're creating a new formulation or just using the generic. 
So if you use the generic and you add it to this research data repository in which we're stacking data in the aggregate, well, then that increases the value of the data repository. If we're creating new uh, intellectual property, a new formulation on it, on it, we can leverage data exclusivity periods throughout the world, which range between uh, three years to 12 years, depending on where you are. For rare disease in the US, it's seven years. For non-rare disease, it's three years. Specifically, though, I think a really great uh, financing model for this is, and I want everybody to take note of this, and please go home and research and do as much due diligence on it as possible, all phase one and phase twos should be happening in Australia. Why? No, no it's actually not funny. It's ex ex extremely the case. Why is this? Because Australian research produces data quality that's as high as the United States or Western Europe, but it's about 50% off. It's 50% of the cost. Uh, how is that? Well, it's about 10 to 15% cheaper just off the bat, but they, the Australian government provides a 43.5% uh, cash back tax incentive. So if you spend $5 million on a clinical trial there and formulation, you're getting 43.5% of that cash back. So the clinical trial only becomes $3 million. On top of that, it is the most efficient uh, regulatory regime in the world. You do not need to ask the government for permission to start an official clinical trial. All you need is essentially ethical approval, an IRB, and it can commence immediately. I've worked with, um, I've been working with a CRO out there for the last year or so. I've received multiple proposals for them on neurodegeneration, specifically ALS, um, and various dermatological diseases. Not one proposal has been over $5 million. This is, these are phase two, official phase two clinical trials on 100 patients. Any new IP, essentially new formulation, uh, they're for repurposed drugs. So new formulations, so that's new IP generating. If it's for rare disease, seven years exclusivity, non-rare disease, three years. If you're able to do that for $5 million or less, that scales medical research without a question. There are essentially no publicly traded biotechs that have advanced through phase two that are valued at less than $100 million. Uh, the other items that I think we should add to this data repository is Bayesian analysis, essentially where do we come from to where we are now, and various different algorithms. How do we start this? Well, if we can get as many researchers together to kind of sign on to this consortium, I'd love to start with the SGC and Spark, basically Oxford and Stanford. What better public signaling is there than that? Then we have a public auction. Anybody in the world could buy into the system, have skin in the game, own a piece of the research. There's one more thing. So this is not all theoretical. We're launching this year. And what are we starting with? We're starting with a new biomarker for Alzheimer's uh, called a plasmalogen. It's not very well known. It's recent research based out of the U US National Institute of Health, University of Pennsylvania, Prodrome Sciences, and Duke University. So the reason why we're starting here is obviously because neurodegeneration is on all of our minds as we age. Um, there are, as Chaz has been saying, it's been a key theme, theme throughout this conference is Dementia, a significant amount of people worldwide suffer from it. I personally know people uh, that have had significant issues with it. Um, and there's currently, there's been significant recent failures with Alzheimer's research. The market for it is absolutely tremendous. And I, I, I don't see a, a, a better initiative that we could start with. There's a tremendous amount of funding in that area. And if we could just capture a small piece of that and build out this data repository um, for this new biomarker, there's likely a very significant amount of uh, ruckus we could cause to the system and potentially blow the whole thing up to create this brand new model. So there's my contact information. I encourage you all to reach out if you have any questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. I think I speak for everybody when I say that was absolutely fascinating. Um, we are running slightly behind schedule, but does anybody have any questions they want to pose now? What's the transaction cost of running such mechanisms in the sense that you have to get the contracts kind of right at the start, is that correct? And in terms of um, um, players in, say, Africa or India, researchers, I mean, is, uh, what's the cost or what's the, the hurdles to being involved? It's great for researchers in our countries, but... Right, excellent question. So I'll start with the transaction costs. Transaction costs are essentially zero. 
because you're using, you're essentially using a public utility. So there are uh, public blockchains that are already in existence and ones that are coming out to date um, in which third parties are essentially running that public, public utility just like the internet. So same transaction cost as you sending an email, nothing. Um, the other question was, what, is, what are the overhead requirements for a researcher in Africa or India getting involved? One of the key reasons why we decided to do this was because there's brilliant science all over the world. Um, science has no boundaries, and oftentimes it's research, you know, obviously Stanford and Oxford are brilliant, but oftentimes there's research that comes from scientists you've never heard of that may have not had any, ha, may have not had any formal education in any capacity that have the most brilliant research. So we want to basically make it so that anybody with internet access could participate in this system the same way anybody with internet access could sign up for email. Last question was, yes, you do have to get the contracts right from the start. That's a key item. Luckily, I'm, I'm a lawyer with significant experience in intellectual property transfer. But then once it's right from the start, uh, there's permissionless exchange of data throughout. Great questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your talk. Um, you say there are a lot of scientists with brilliant research ideas, but at the same time we have tremendous waste in research and uh, biology is just really, really difficult. So how does the new system take care of quality and um, all that really awfully bad research that just floods journals and uh, floods medical development? How would you control that? Another excellent question. So what we've seen, everybody here uses Uber? Yeah. Uber reputation scores are incredible. Um, so I, I live in New York City and regularly use Uber. I will not get in an Uber that's below 4.5 stars. Similar with Airbnb, I'm a regular user of Airbnb. These systems are really great. So scientists would essentially have uh, reputation scores. So the key item there is you really need to start at a premier institution like uh, Stanford or Oxford to make this go, or uh, l launch uh, research from a very high institution like the NIH, University of Pennsylvania, Duke, to make it go. And then from there, it should trigger it ongoing. And then if it's um, everybody is economically incentivized, like all the scientists here would have a piece of the action. You would all have blockchain tokens that would trade on a public market. So it would be your, in your best interest to essentially have the best research bubble to the top irrespective of what's going on. So it would no longer be about which institution are you from, but about the quality of the science as mediated by your peers. If, if let's say, we in this room or Oxford wanted to work with Stanford and we were going to work on rare diseases and we were going to do what Lynn suggested earlier, go down the repurposing, what's the next step? How much funding do we need? How do we start it off? So the, the brilliance with drug repurposing is that if you get with audacious MDs and you know, really pioneering patients, they're able to see what works and what doesn't before it gets to the uh, multi-million dollar phase two clinical trial. And I, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here as you, you kind of know, you probably have a list yourself of repurposed drugs that you have a really good inkling whether or not they work. So it would basically be putting all of these drugs, and we could start it in a private repository so that everybody feels comfortable, gets to know each other first, um, and then takes it from there. And then what I would really love to do is have the researchers at Stanford and Oxford rank which assets are most efficient, which have the, be the best chance of both disrupting the system but curing patients. So based on my proposals from Australia, each clinical trial outright, you know, and again, this is to scale the system, um, I said $5 million before, but actually the most expensive one was $3.2 million. And then with their 43.5% uh, tax incentive, each phase two itself comes out to $2 million. And again, there's no biotech on a publicly traded market that has advanced at least one asset through phase two that is valued at less than $100 million in the aggregate. So the chance of getting a a drug, a repurposed drug through phase two, historically, if you look at the Bayesian models, is about 33%. So if we just want one drug to hit, we need one out of three, right? So one out of three times three million, that's $9 million cash up front and then half off. 
If we really want to make sure we, we hit it, almost guaranteed, start with 10 assets, we're going to hit on three of them, three and a half, maybe four of them. So to get 10 assets through, um, to start, if, if we're doing these in Australia, we need 30 million up front and then get 43 and a half percent cash back. Uh, so that would be net cost of about $18 million. And then from there, we've spun up, if we just have three drugs with either new IP or non-new IP, we've likely created a network worth over a billion dollars. Um, and this is proven based on the statistics. So if you're writing the check, Chaz, 30 million. <laughs> Great, great talk. Um, so I love the concept of blockchain, of course, to record transactions. But also, when you open up, you are allowing, what do you end up capturing? What I'm thinking here, just as papers, you have so many research that are duplicated because people have similar ideas, surprisingly. That's exactly uh, right. The same thing, they get to very similar conclusions. They all register this transactionally. And then I'm thinking, just like the Amazon model, you can Google for one, or you can Amazon for one, 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 one item and it comes 30 versions of it. You never know which one's the best to buy unless you pay the cash, right? So how do you solve this conundrum with, with your model? Do you have to pay to see because the, therefore you have the key to unlock the transaction and then have a test run before you commit and take it forward? Or is this something that if, I'm trying to be breaking the system here, if I look at something I like, what stops me from just duplicating exactly what it is and take it forward? Right, so without erasing all the transaction, because I have the data already. Right, so that's, that's like the key question. So I'm gonna go back to this slide. So you, you, you asked, uh, where is it? Why, why can't you just steal the research, right? So same thing goes to Sci-Hub and Elsevier. Why has Elsevier's revenues been growing to over $3 billion in the last few years when all the research is public? You could just steal it off Sci-Hub, why? So it's based in copyright. Same thing with a music license in a motion picture. You can realize the music at home. You have like essentially a personal right to use it, but the commercial right is you have to pay for it. So yeah, you could be a bad actor. But that's the end user. What right. Our research is taking something that is in development and taking a step further, closer to a product, right? Right. So in that sense, I could be taking all this data, just starting my own data set, and then from from that on, say, oh, I've never seen this data set, but don't, don't tell them right. about it, and then develop something that you would take to the market. Then, of course, you know, when you try to bring all the different innovation together, you'd be inviting people to come with similar ideas, but never does it work. Right. Uh, some of these patent holders. So, so it's really based in market incentives. So in a perfect world, you would be able to do that, but we have the valley of death, right? Yeah. So in a perfect world, you're saying if you have a billion dollars in your pocket, you go in this system, steal all the research, and go on with it. But in our world that we're in today, that's absolutely not the case. Um, there is a complete lack of funding out there. And if you're the scientist that wants to steal this research, essentially perverse incentives, how do we handle this? Well, if you have an economic incentive to instead of steal the research, to build into the system because you own some of these blockchain tokens, you own this research. And not only that, but your peers collectively own it as well. So the more research that you're pushing forward, the more value that your tokens become worth. So you're essentially, by stealing it, you're taking from the system, similar to how in the Bitcoin uh, world, that software is also open source. Every time uh, a third party tries to steal it, fork it, create their own system, their own currency, it never works. Why? Because it's the market incentive um, is that it's better to join the system, increase the value, contribute to the software code, than it is to steal it and go off on your own and you're gonna lose every, everybody else. On top of it, all your peers at Oxford would say, you're a bad actor, kick this guy out, don't let him in. But then taking it even further, it's really about the copyright, right? You don't have, if, if you do that, you're violating the copyright. You don't have commercial rights um, of which, again, why is Elsevier's revenues radic dramatically increasing year over year? Why doesn't everybody just use Sci-Hub? Yeah, sure. It, it, it's again, it's, it's it's the market. It's 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 the free market, and and currently where it stands today. I had a question a bit like Lee's. Um, you know, copyright protects something that's written down, but an experiment, if it's written down, you could just repeat the experiment, and then you would own it. So I take your point about scientific, um, you know, the, the the respect of your peers, but you know, drug companies could just repeat the experiments 
own them sure. in their own right and then not pay to license for anybody else, right? Okay. So in my experience, and again, I have it working with big pharma, biotechs, CROs, nonprofits, universities, no pharmaceutical company, venture firm, or private equity firm cares until you've proved it in phase two clinical trials. There's an endless amount of research out there. I personally know of cures that could scale globally. Pharmaceutical industry is genuinely not interested in it because it has not been through phase two clinical trials. So yes, that could absolutely happen, and I expect that it would. At the same time, though, the what blockchains have the ability to do is align human coordination at unprecedented scale, because if that pharmaceutical company, sure, they could do that, and then they violated the terms, and then they'd be kind of um, an outcast in the system, as opposed to would they be creating more value if they now have access to all these brilliant researchers, they're economically aligned with all of them because they all own blockchain tokens, and they're, everybody is collectively actively uh, promoting the research, contributing to it, building the research repository in which then if these tokens are traded on a uh, free market, and as we've seen with patients like me, the more research that is stacked, the more valuable it becomes, which means if the research is directly monetized, the more valuable those tokens become, which means it's a win-win for everybody. So sure, you can steal the research, but then you'd be out of the system and you, you essentially would no longer be on the team. It's the same thing in Bitcoin. Go steal the research, it's like see what happens. You'll be an outcast from the system. But Bitcoin, I mean, is, is a monetary system. If you make a drug, people will buy it. They probably don't care how you got there. I sure, I, I, again, so there's the valley of death. Uh, 90% of research just sits in labs. Drug repurposing has never really been um, an interest to big pharma. So, and no one really cares until you hit phase two. So by the time you hit phase two clinical trial, you're already so ahead of the game. The other key item here, which I haven't touched on yet, is if we have this public auction, right, such that anybody could buy in, ideally we raise somewhere between 30, 30 million to a billion dollars to make this happen, so go off on your own, steal the data, go to your venture firm, say, yes, we stole this data, we repeated the experiment, we don't have the support of Stanford or Oxford anymore, and we want to raise money around this. And not only did we steal the data and repeat this experiment, because this is already published, you can no longer get a patent on it. So this is prior art on yours. Um, it's the market. It's, it's the market and the incentives that have been built around it. Ex excellent questions, though. Okay, last question, and then we'll yeah, just mind genuinely blown by this and trying to think through kind of all the different ways in which it um, could increase, I guess, that democracy, that public um, entry point. Do you see this as a way that could allow patient advocate groups, um, you know, the crowdfunding, um, crowdsourcing type model, uh, because there's a potentially lower financial threshold and potentially a much more democratic way of owning that value, um, it, it's a way to get much quick, much more permeably into the public domain with the public as backers and the public as investors, if you like, is that potentially one way this could go? That's exactly right. So there's just a limited amount of funding to go around. Historically, um, it's, it's, it's not even sovereign wealth funds. It's just governments and big pharma. Uh, governments have to take care of a whole population and big pharma have a fiduciary duty to shareholders. So they have their own operations, whereas humans just civilians, there's no reason why we can no longer, we, we can't align and make this happen. All the digital tools are in place to allow this to go forward at global scale. So absolutely, essentially empowering patients and humans all over the world to make this happen and putting science back in the hands of scientists. We really want to scale this thing. Okay. So thank you so much for your questions. Really appreciate it.